Okay, we're going to get started with our next session. We've entered the longer session um, part of our day, um, so these sessions are now going to be 40 minutes until later this afternoon. Um, so without any further ado, I'm pleased to uh, present Roman Moore from Red Hat, who will be talking about um, the merger of VMs and containers. Thank you, Roman. Hi, everyone. So is the microphone maybe a little bit? Hi, everyone. Still more up. So now, it, yeah, now it's great. So hi, everyone. Glad to see you all here. Uh, as Brian already said, I'm Roman Moore. I'm working for Red Hat as a software engineer. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about how we can arrange pet VMs and containers. And for all of those who, which do not know what pet VMs are, pet VMs are basically the opposite of cloud VMs, and that means whenever you have an application inside a VM and you think a lot about how you can migrate it or keep it up without shutting down the VM, then you're basically talking about the pet VM. And on the other hand, you have containers or cloud VMs, and yeah, obviously there you don't care that much about the state of the VM, it's just more about uh, spawning the VM again if it goes down. But now let's start with, with the actual topic. So, I, so first I want to talk to you a little bit about how we can arrange pet VMs and containers together in with different management solutions. Then I want to tell you a little bit on how we even care about it. Uh, after that, I want to show you how typical virtualization and container stacks look like on the host. Then finally, how one could try to bring VMs into Kubernetes. Further, a little bit low, more low level question then is how we can bring VMs into a container if we want to. And finally, I want to present you, uh, give you a small overview about Keyword. That's the project that I'm working on, where I hope is a good project which tries to combine all the insights I want to present you first. So let's start with a little story about how we can manage VMs and containers together. Let's suppose you're an administrator in a medium-sized company and you're used to your overt or uh, VMware virtualization stack and there is an engineer coming to you and he says, yeah, I have this new containerized scalable application I want to host with Kubernetes. Could you give me, I don't know, maybe 10 VMs, make sure they're all running on different hosts and I will do the rest for you regarding to that. And the guy goes away and finally a few days later someone says, hey, the application isn't up, can you take a look? And you look into side, in, inside all the containers and VMs and there you see, hey, the guy was really good at this installing, he created his Kubernetes deployment in there, made it HA, on, made sure that his application can scale up and down in there. Uh, but what he's doing there, it looks pretty much like what you're doing on the host level already with your virtualization stack. So he's, he's collecting metrics, he's, uh, he's, uh, he makes sure that specific components are always running, yeah, he's monitoring all that. And so he starts thinking, maybe you as an infrastructure guy should also care a little bit about what's going on there, especially if something isn't right. Um, and so you start looking into that more closely, how you could start managing that. And one thing which is obvious there is that you have different layers of services in each other and they're all managed by different schedulers. For instance, Kubernetes has its own scheduler, uh, Overt has its own scheduler, or Remember has its own schedulers, and you have to, and so, and even the applications inside of Kubernetes do their own kind of scheduling regarding to scaling up or scaling down, regarding to traffic and so on. And when we're doing virtualization like we have it here, uh, with containers inside or a container management framework inside, it's pretty hard for, for instance, the DevOps team to, to just care about the container infrastructure. You basically have to go back to the host level and the VM level to make sure that your containers are properly placed, properly placed around the stack. So as an administrator, you're now thinking about 
removing that layering to get more out of your VMs, more performance, make the placement of the services and containers easier. And you might think about placing them next to each other on the same host. And there you can have, yeah, you can run into a lot of problems. Uh, most of the demons for different management solutions are completely taking over the host. So even just trying to place two different management solution, solutions on the same host is very, very hard. Uh, another thing you could do is you could try to split your data center. So yeah, let's keep the traditional data center where we're caring about our, all our VMs and only put them on one kind of host and put all the containers on, the, on another type of host where you're managing everything with, with let's say, Kubernetes. Um, that kind of solves at least these problems we haven't been mentioning before, but you still have all the applications regarding to monitoring everything, collecting the metrics, uh, uh, making, you have two different systems which you need to keep HA also. For instance, Overt or VMware needs to be HA, Kubernetes needs to be HA, and so, I mean, you can do that, it solves some problems, especially relating to host utilizations, on the special part of your data center, but you, for instance, if you have a lot of spare resources on your VM part of the data center, you can't just move containers there, so it's still not optimal. And another approach would be, hey, let's start running VMs inside containers. The advantage with this approach would be that containers have much less assumptions than pet VMs about their lifespan. If it goes down, you can just start it again, and uh, and so it's, it's, it's a kind of lower layer for all the services which you could use, and the VM, which for instance needs to migrate, can be migrated off of a container before the container is actually removed. So that could fit pretty nice into one uh, one management solution. Or you could go even a little bit farther, but that is more the cloud approach. You could start putting the side VMs again containers. For instance, Google Cloud Engine is doing that, if I remember it correctly. Uh, I think they're using Borg, which creates containers where they're starting VMs, and they, these are the VMs you can rent when you're renting VMs. And inside there, what are, the, what are people doing there? They're deploying Kubernetes on top of it. And there it completely makes sense because there is a different assumption there. You're just talking about cloud VMs and also about the separation of concern. Google as a cloud provider doesn't care what the application does, but you as an administrator in a small company, you definitely have to care about it. So that is probably not what we want here, but it's a nice thing you could do. Um, so to sum it up a little bit with some facts is why we really care about bringing all that together is for one kind of applications which have specific needs. There are those VMs which need really high performance, uh, those services which really need high performance. And if you have a lot of them, virtualization overhead might matter. Another thing is that you have your, no, I don't like calling them legacy applications, but you have your monolithic applications, which in most cases are even until now your cash cows for your company, so you can't just leave them behind. And then you have the microservice-based applications. They don't care that much about performance, but they are already cloud-ready, you, and you have your DevOps teams, which just want to scale up and down however it pleases them. They don't want to ask for new VMs, tell administrators uh, which container is allowed to run on the same host or the same VM or so on. They just want to deploy the thing when you run. Then you have management needs like hyperconversions. Um, as you've seen before with the different approaches, approaches I've presented, you, when you have a lot of different frameworks, you have a lot of different components which are very hard to administer, especially when you run them on the same hosts. So you would end up with a lot of small clusters which are there for different things. One cluster would be there to manage your VM infrastructure, make it hell available, one little cluster would be there for providing, for just giving you the network provider for that, that manager. Then you have a network provider for your Kubernetes stuff and so on. And it's really hard to get all that together when you really try to manage two management layers in, the, in each other. Another thing is, yeah, I've already mentioned it somehow, is high availability of all the services. Um, for instance, Kubernetes has a very nice concept of high availability built in. So if you're not trying to 
uh, teach your applications which are ready for the cloud to work with your virtualization environment, you could instead rewrite your virtualization infrastructure that you can just deploy it as a container and make use of HA concepts which you can use from Kubernetes out of, uh, out of the box. And when, we're, when we can achieve the goal of combining those two, it costs a lot of money. Less components to manage means less things which can go wrong and makes, makes everything easier. Uh, but that's not the only kind of uh, benefits we can get. Another benefit, of course, is that when you look at the host stack of virtualization infrastructure and of container infrastructure, they kind of do similar things in a little, slightly different ways. But uh, for instance, on the Ovid stack, you have VDSM. That's the host daemon, which is doing monitoring of VMs, does storage mounting, disk provisioning. Then you have network providers inside VDSM. Um, and on Kubernetes, you have the kubelet, which is the daemon of Kubernetes. And it does pretty much the same thing. It does monitoring, it does storage. It somehow makes sure that network is there. Um, of course, especially for instance, network in, in the container world, you don't care that much about la layer two networking, but it also doesn't hurt, for instance, if it would be layer two for them, if it still provides the appearance. And so you could then, for instance, reuse your networking stack for both, for VMs and Kubernetes. And when you then go down, uh, farther down a little bit more, there are also some difference of differences, of course. Um, on the virtualization stack, you will have, have something like Libwork or Kuyumo, um, which is very VM-centric, and there's a lot of knowledge stream with it, in it with, which reflects how, how you keep VMs alive, how you can migrate them. And on the Kubernetes stack there, you have something completely different. That's the container runtime implementation. But uh, if we can somehow manage to keep the Libvirt knowledge in the picture, or the Virt knowledge in the picture which Libvirt provides, and still can run uh, and, and still can run everything in pods, it might be a nice solution which we end up with. So we at Qubit we tried a few different approaches, or I mean we didn't all try all of them, but we at least played through a few approaches on how we could combine Kubernetes and and PetVMs. And one very obvious approach would be to just try to extend Kubernetes to support everything a VM would also need. So instead of Parts it would then also be able to start a VM. You could say, okay, I want my migration controller in there and all hot plugging and so on. We could all add, add, try, at least try to add all of that to Kubernetes. But I think that would mean that we are basically destroying Kubernetes. Kubernetes is so nice because it doesn't have to care about this. It's a very low, very nice, low level sandbox, which, which is really well suited to clouds and to provide, providing basic rollout of services. Uh, so another approach would be we could try to, instead of teaching Kubernetes everything about VMs, we could try to kind of mutate pods to VMs by just replacing the, the host daemon of Kubernetes. That's the kubelet. And there are two approaches out there which are trying to, or two projects out there which are trying to do that. One is Hyper and the other one is uh, Wiltlet. And they're both trying to replace uh, the kubelet. And instead of starting a pod, you're basically starting a VM, where in one case of Hyper, you're then running the pod inside there, or in the case of Wiltlet, you're just having a plain VM then where you can do whatever you want with it. And that kind of works, but uh, you really don't have any real way of expressing your virtualization needs on a cluster level. It's really, you kind of have to fit everything in the pod metadata and then extract it there and yeah, it kind of feels hacky and it gets even harder than when you think about Numa support and migrations and stuff like that. You can't just easily pull that back to the scheduling layer, uh, to the cluster layer regarding to scheduling and representing that nice. Um, another approach which you could try is to keep the kubelet like it is and just have one container inside a pod which 
spawns a QEMO process. At the end, at the end is nothing more than a QEMO process. Of course, you have all migration possibilities and everything, but QEMO does all that for you. It's just the process at the end. Um, but then you have finally have the problem, yeah, I have the, my QEMO process now in the container, but how do I manage it? I mean, I want to do hot plug now, so I have to connect to it, and so you have to start building infrastructure around it. The simplest thing, of course, would be to put also the update logic and everything inside a container next to the pod or into the pod, but that's kind of hard to manage, and again, you don't have, you don't get any benefits from Kubernetes regarding to managing all that. So what we finally came up with is trying to build uh, VM management on top of Kubernetes. And Kubernetes helps us there already because they've seen, hey, there's so many people which are trying to do their stuff with Kubernetes and we can't manage to integrate all that in Kubernetes. So they're decomposing it and one, one, one thing they, for instance, introduced are third party resources. That means like a pod, you can register your own objects in the API server, you can post them, you can listen for changes on those objects as well. And we started doing that with a VM object. Um, this also, and even better, Kubernetes extracted their core code for doing that as in a, a, some kind of an SDK. So we can really use the core Kubernetes code for expressing that. And, and then we can also create uh, our host daemon, which can work with the same principles like Hubert, but just has to care about VM stand. I will tell you, um, I will have some slides later on where you can see how we're actually doing the placing. Uh, we can further, since we have our own daemon now, we can further still let Libvirt do the work stuff. And so we can basically build our own pipeline next to the Kubernetes pipeline after a pod is scheduled in a node. And we can reuse the complete Kubernetes infrastructure there. And yeah, as I said, the big question now is how do we finally place the VM inside a running pod? That, because that's where you end up at the end. So you let Kubernetes do what it can, can do best. You, start, you just let it start a pod. And when the pod is running, there's still no VM inside. Now, only when the pod is running, your, your host daemon for the VM is, noticed, is notified that there is an iPod and is trying to start the VM. So you kind of have to bring it inside the pod. And, and there you can ask yourself a few interesting questions. First of all, does it even make sense to have a VM in the pod? Um, and there are, that was a very hot topic when we started with Qbridge if it's even possible or if it makes sense. And um, to answer these questions, we have to look, we need to have a look on what containers actually are. And from my perspective, containers are two things. One, it's just a tool for resource isolation, uh, for security reasons, for resource usage. And the other thing is you can group your application with different together, containers together. So it's more a logical thing on how you want to few on your applications. And when you look at the technical details, C groups are just, C, uh, containers are just C groups and namespaces. Um, and so the next question here is, what does Kubernetes really care about? Does it care about this one, or does it more care about the logical representation? And yeah, I mean, it's kind of both. It's, of course, at the end here you have containers, and you have namespaces and C groups, but Kubernetes doesn't ca care that much how much isolated your containers are. So you can, of course, use host pit with your pods. You can, of course, use host networking if you want to. It would still be containers and it's still be pods. So for Kubernetes, that's fine. That's a very, I mean, that doesn't sound like very much, but for us, that's a very, very important uh, fact because it gives us some freedom on how we decide to bring VMs into containers and how much we want to bring them in. For instance, when I think about uh, device hot plugging, if we can create our own C groups just for devices where we allow specific stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be the C group of, uh, of a pod, but on the other hand, for instance, the pit namespace of, of a pod can be very important for our VM just to ensure that when the pod goes down, that the VM also goes down, for instance, stuff like that. So we can choose her out of the best roles, I think, every level we want. And further, when we now go back to the VMs, Libvirt already puts VMs half into containers, so it's not only possible, it's what we kind of have already anyway. Um, 
So that's nice in the first glance. It kind of is also a problem for us if we want to really, really decide where we want to bring the VM. So we are also very happy that Libert is an extremely flexible project. And you can also disable it that it tries to manage the C groups. Fiverr has even more hooks. Like, if, for instance, you can say instead of directly calling QEMU, you can tell the group, hey, when I, want, when I want to start a VM, please don't call QEMU directly, call my wrapper binary before so that you, we can do additional stuff. And that's the final piece we needed to bring our VMs finally into C group, uh, into the pods, because now we can, uh, we can really freely decide where we want to start our queuing process, in which C groups, which namespaces, is completely up to us. And Libvirt provides us the function, still provides us all the high level virtualization functionality we need. And that finally combined, all that combined leads to Libvirt, uh, to Keyvert, where, where we tried to combine all that. And when we, before we look on how we started uh, VM in, in in Qbert, it's probably good for everyone who doesn't know how to have a look on how uh, playing Kubernetes starts a pod. And there is not so much going on, actually. You have a, co a tool called Cube Control. With Cube Control, you can just post a pod definition to the API server. When that's posted, the scheduler sees, oh, there is a new VM defini uh, pod definition, so I have to react to it and schedule it there somewhere. After it has done that, the kubelet sees from the API server, oh, now there is a pod scheduled to my node, so I have to take care of it and start it. And that's basically all. That's some of the things I like very much about Kubernetes, that although it's, from the f when you look at it, on the first glance, it looks so complex what you can do and how it works, but at the end, that's already one of the core things Kubernetes does for you, and, and it's really simple. And in Kubernetes, since I said we're just trying to build on top of Kubernetes, we just added a few things there. Uh, just two components, mainly, the word controller and the word handler. The word controller is a cluster-wide daemon, which is watching for new VM specifications, which are posted. And the virtual handler is, the, is, is our host daemon, which sits next to the kubelet. And when you now start, uh, try to start a VM, you're not posting a pod. You are posting a VM definition, which we implemented based on third party resources. That's what the virtual controller sees. The virtual controller is now with the VM watch loop. The virtual controller is now creating a pod of, out of it and posting it to the API server. That's what the scheduler sees. It's, po it's then scheduling the pod. The virtual controller sees that the pod is now scheduling and running and updates the VM definition that it was assigned to a specific pod, uh, to a specific node. And their word handler now says, oh, this is a VM which is for me. So we're basically following the same principles Kubernetes is already using for the pods. We're just extending it that we can schedule something on top of the pods. And the benefit here is that we let every component do what we think they can do best. Kubernetes just has to take care about pods. Um, we have our word controller unit there, which is doing the translation between the two layers of Kubernetes and, and our VMs. And the word handler itself doesn't even have to know anything about pods. It just has to manage, has to, has, has to look on the API server for VMs, which appear and are meant to be assigned to it. And it can then move on everything pass on everything to Libre to start the VM, and it doesn't have to know anything about uh, C groups or namespaces or pods even. Really just plain VM management. And Libre itself just does what it always does, just starts a VM or updates a VM. But since we are using this emulator tag in Libre, we can, before we directly call QEM, we can we can take all the QEMU arguments, detect the namespaces and C groups on the host, completely isolated from all other components which we want to use and start the QEMU process there. So, I think I was way too fast. 
because I'm already at the end. So, <laughs> um, so we have a demo up and running on the internet on Kubert. You can just try the one-liner demo here. It will spawn a VM for you, and you can play around with our with our Kubernetes uh, experiment. And you can also visit us on GitHub, and we would be happy if you contribute or try to understand what we're doing and give us feedback if you like it or not. And thank you, and questions. <laughs> So, just some questions? Yeah, please. So, uh, you're rejecting the VM process in the whole system. Sorry, I can't hear you. Could you? You're rejecting the VM, the VM process in the whole namespace. So, when the port dies, the VM also dies. How does the VM die? Is it the race? Is it the whole process? So, the question was. So when you play, since we're using the namespaces of the pod for the QEMO process, what happens if the if the pod dies or the VM dies? How how what's going on there then? And um, so in the pod where we're moving the VM, we have a, we have a, a shim process, which is basically just an infrastructure process which keeps the pod open for us. And this one also detects when the QEMO process is started there. And when Kubernetes wants to stop the pod, it first sends a sick term, and you can react to that signal. And you have a specific, a specific amount of time you can specify. And we're forwarding that sick term to the QEMU process. So the QEMU process gets it normal shutdown signal it's used to react to. Uh, of course, when it can't shut down fast enough, it will get a sick kill. Uh, or basically, the shim process will get a sick kill. And since then, the pit namespace is gone, the VM gets a sick kill too. Yeah. In that case, nothing because we disabled it from the configuration. It will just be ignored. Oh, the question was what happens to the Libvirt XML things? I mean, in the Libvirt XML, when you're managing C groups, you can specify how much CPU and memory the game can get. And what happens if we disable that? So the, the answer is it just gets ignored. But Kubernetes itself provides the same mechanism, so you can add it to the pod, and all the VM definition will pop in the logo, so the pod gets it too. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you for your attention.